Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to this mayoral forum on housing for the 2021 candidates for mayor of New York City. Um, I am Richard Semigram. I am an attorney at HCC, and we are so grateful that you are all here. Uh, HCC is a community-based not-for-profit organization in the Hell's Kitchen Clinton neighborhood on Manhattan's west side. Uh, we work with tenants in our community organizing for change, and we work with the West Side Neighborhood Alliance. I encourage all of you to check out our website to come and get involved with our work. Um, and I will turn it over now to our moderator for this panel, Ben Max, the executive editor of Gotham Gazette. And I also encourage all of you to support the crucial journalism work of Gotham Gazette that covers issues that are so important, including housing for the future of our city. It is important that we support not-for-profit news organizations like Gotham Gazette. And we are very grateful for Ben Max for uh, moderating this event. And without further ado, Ben, please. Thank you, Richard. And thank you for all the work that you do. And thank you for bringing everybody together today. Um, I am Ben Max, editor of Gotham Gazette. Please find us at GothamGazette.com. Uh, and we're going to get right into our discussion on housing and homelessness here in just one minute. I just want to thank the 15th annual Westside Tenants Conference. It's great to be here on this 15th year uh, for having me and this discussion today. The housing conservation coordinators uh, that Richard just spoke about that he's part of uh, and everybody else who's brought this forum together. Uh, it's obviously uh, a discussion and organizations focused on helping some of the city's most vulnerable people, seniors, low-income tenants, immigrants, uh, people who need legal advocacy, legal services, and other programs, and uh, obviously fighting to uh, improve one of the great crises that this city continues to face related to affordable housing, as well as uh, homelessness, which is directly related to that. So thank you for having me. Uh, I do want to note we have eight mayoral candidates here with us today. There are obviously others in the field that folks should hear from as the race continues ahead of the June primaries and the November general election next year. I'm about to introduce our candidates today. And candidates, uh, as I introduce you, we're going to start our first round in the same order that I introduce you, which is alphabetically by first name. So just be ready here. As I introduce you, that'll be the same order. I'll prompt you again, but that's the order we'll go with for the first round of questions. There will be five rounds of questions in total uh, dealing with housing and homelessness, including perhaps some follow-ups from me, depending on how the, the conversation goes. So joining us today, the mayoral candidates that we have with us are Carlos Menchaca, a city council member from Brooklyn, chair of the city council's immigration committee. Diane Morales, a former nonprofit executive, most recently at Phipps Neighborhoods. Eric Adams, the Brooklyn Borough President, a former state senator and former NYPD captain. And Joyce Lynn Taylor, Ms. Taylor is the CEO of TaylorMade Contracting. Catherine Garcia was most recently the New York City Sanitation Commissioner and the New York City COVID Food Czar. Maya Wiley is a civil rights attorney, professor, and former counsel to Mayor Bill de Blasio, former chair of the Civilian Complaint Review Board. Scott Stringer is the New York City Comptroller, former Manhattan Borough President, former Assembly Member. And Sean Donovan, former Housing Secretary under President Obama, former Budget Director under President Obama, and former Housing Commissioner under Mayor Bloomberg. So let's get right into it here in just a moment. We're gonna start in that same order. So council member Menchaca will go first, but just real quick, the rules of the road here are going to be that uh, on each question, candidates will have about a minute and a half to initially answer. So you have a little bit of time there to, to get into some detail. And then about a minute of follow-up exchange with me each time. So. For example, right now from the start, we're gonna start with Council Member Menchaca, who have a minute and a half to discuss his answer to the first question. And then I will probably follow up with Council Member Menchaca for another minute before we move on to our second candidate for the first question, Diane Morales. 
All right, so hopefully that makes sense to everybody. Each round, uh, candidates will have a minute and five, a minute and a half to answer each question with a little follow-up conversation. We start with a couple of housing questions. We move into homelessness. Though so again, as I said, that's all related and connected, of course. So Richard, unless there's anything else anybody needs to know, uh, let's get right to the candidates. So Councilmember Menchaca, we'll start with you. Um, we're gonna start with NYCHA. What would your mayoral administration do to support and improve conditions at NYCHA? And as part of that, we definitely want you to address how you would approach the RAD program, Rental Assistance Demonstration. Go ahead. Thank you, Ben and HEC for having me today. I wanna to start with this. I wanna answer the NYCHA question with a kind of very simple approach, just fix it. What that means is what I wanna actually do, which has been a big conversation in the city council is to inject a massive amount of city capital dollars to getting to all of the issues uh, in Red Hook, Red Hook East and West, we've seen an incredible amount of injection of federal money that's fixing the outside, essentially the resiliency component. That's half a billion dollars worth of work. Uh, and that was the silver lining to Sandy. Nothing is happening inside. Apartments continue to have mold. Uh, the pipes for gas continue to erode. And those are big impacts to families, especially during winter around heat and hot water and gas. What we need to do is just put money in. I know we're waiting for the federal government, but the city capital can balloon into big proportions to do things like Green New Deal. Uh, and part of that has to be NYCHA. Uh, so essentially put billions of dollars into the capital budget. I don't have, I don't have a lot of time. RAD has been a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, NYCHA residents don't support it. Uh, I think I'm gonna leave it there. And I think we need new ideas and how to build more uh, more revenue, but those ideas are not around rad. I'll pause right, there. So, so where does that money come from? Uh, you want to infuse? You're talking about the capital. Cap You're talking about the capital budget. The money that you referred that needs to be put into NYCHA. Yes, absolutely. Where where yes. does that? Money this is from? this is the capital budget. So every year we negotiate with the mayor around 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 expense and capital. Uh, what we don't do is actually increase the debt service that we can take on as a city. Uh, we are we are in a point where the budget is decreasing, no doubt, in terms of tax revenue. But this is where we need to prioritize the ability to actually inject jobs into our communities, uh, Green New Deal style, uh, NYCHA focused, massive amounts, billions of dollars into our budget. Uh, we can decrease the budget expenses by defunding the NYPD dramatically. Uh, we can look at a possible $3 billion removal of the budget uh, to do things like this. And that's the courage that I will display, not just as mayor, uh, but to tell the public housing community that we are with them. And now finally, we'll wait. What was finally, that? What, what's, a, what's the problem with RAD? What do you understand is to be the, the problem? Well, beyond the incredible uh, removal of agency from, from NYCHA residents that transforms their relationship with their housing, uh, uh, their relationship with housing, I think that this continues to push conversations around prior uh, privatization of our public housing, which would be a big mistake for the city of New York. Okay, we're gonna move to Diane Morales. Uh, same question to you around how your administration would approach uh, NYCHA and investment in NYCHA. And if you can specifically make sure to, to address RAD at some point in your answer, go ahead. Sure, thanks, Ben. Um, I guess, first of all, I would wanna say that, you know, the New York City Public Housing Authority is a terrible landlord at the moment. Um, when I think about public housing, I think about my parents actually, who, who moved into Sumner houses in the 50s and we're really, really excited about the promise that that provided for them and our family. Um, the system today is just in total disrepair and we need to be able to move to move back to what it used to be by investing in what I, you know, I, I believe is that we should invest in the Green New Deal for NYCHA. Um, you know, NYCHA is the, is the home to more than 400,000 New Yorkers and they have every bit of right as everyone else to live comfortably and safely. I think we need to revitalize NYCHA and that would make a significant impact on in, in revitalizing our city overall. So my administration would work to repair NYCHA through a, a focus 
um, really an emphasis on racial, economic, and environmental justice. Um, that is, is one of the sort of pillars of, of my campaign, and I think NYCHA is a great place to start. Um, and that would mean that there's no sweet deals or handoffs to private developers in response to your question about, about RAD. I think we've got to focus on retrofitting our buildings and investing in the capital repair. Uh, I, you know, None of that is going to happen in one administration. I think it's important to recognize that uh, the buildings are in such severe disrepair that it's going to take a long-term commitment. Uh, but we do need to transition our buildings to carbon-free energy. And we need to also fund the workforce development uh, as someone who has created and operated workforce training programs for a long time, I understand what it would take and, and what it would, the difference that it would make in the lives of, of tenants and residents to be able to participate in workforce development programs, to have the skills that they need to help and participate in the process of retrofitting and, and renovating NYCHA. Um, so similar similar follow-up to you, uh, Ms. Morales, the, the money, billions, tens of billions of dollars that NYCHA needs, where do you think that comes from? Yep, where do you, I, where do you try to make sure it comes from? Sure. I mean, I, I'll build on Carlos's response. I, you know, I think just overall in the housing market in New York City, we need to de decommodify housing and we need to move away from the speculative market. Um, I, the, the private market approach to housing in our city has uh, significantly contributed to the challenges that that homeowners and renters face today. So, you know, I think about the, the public taxes, the pr public subsidies that we provide um, to private developers in form of tax breaks and subsidies and those kinds of things should actually be first prioritized to communi the community and to, to residents so that they can actually live in dignity. Um, the other thing I think we should be thinking about is I think we should be looking at land value taxation. Um, we should be disincentivizing landowners from being able to sit on privately owned vacant or bl blighted land while they wait for it to rise in value. Um, and then finally, I'd say, you know, I think we need to take a really hard look at expanding fees for luxury developments and for vacancies um, and assessing fees for displacement as well. Thank you. Okay, Borough President Eric Adams, same question to you. How would your administration approach uh, investment in NYCHA? And if you can please uh, address RAD at some point in your answer, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben, and really thank the entire group for putting this together. Uh, let's focus on this. Uh, as I'm going to talk about throughout this entire campaign, uh, NYCHA is just a reflection of the dysfunctionality of our city. Our city is dysfunctional, and once we acknowledge uh, that fact, we can start moving uh, in the right direction. Uh, we are running our agencies are uh, inefficient and those inefficiencies create uh, what I call inequities and they give way to injustices. And I'm going to lay that out throughout the entire campaign. And NYCHA is a perfect example of what is taking place there. The major secret to NYCHA and why we're having real problems is because not only are the buildings broken, but the people don't trust government. First thing I would do is I'm going to give them an attorney that they are going to uh, interview and decide, not a city intern attorney, but someone in private practice that we will pay for so they can be in the room negotiating these important issues such as RAD. Second, I'm going to look at selling the air rights of NYCHA to local community developers so that we can come up with the potential $8 billion in air rights uh, that are there. We have almost 78, 78 million square feet of air rights that's possible to be sold, to pay for it. Money's not coming from the NYCHA uh, guard. No, it has to come from real ideas of getting money inside NYCHA. It is, it is a blemish on our, our city, what we're doing in NYCHA. And, and so can you expand a little bit more on your opinion of RAD? I mean, you know, does, does it sound, it sounds a little bit like you want to first get more of a gauge from NYCHA residents about how they feel about RAD, or do you have an opinion at this point about whether we should scale back or expand RAD? No, not, we know how they feel about RAD. And is think about the, the complicated interaction with the city agency, and you don't really understand it. I was out in Rockaway uh, with uh, Councilman Donovan Richards, uh, the RAD program there, where many of the tenants did not like it until he took the time to communicate with them. 
and they slowly embraced it and saw the beauty of their apartments uh, transform and their grounds transform. Oftentimes when I'm on NYCHA property, which I spend a lot of time in NYCHA, the residents want to be communicated with the level of dignity and respect that they deserve. It can't be just talking about uh, how we're going to transform the system when the state and the federal government has abandoned, they both have abandoned uh, NYCHA and it's time to engage our tenants. They're smart enough to understand, let's give them real legal representation so they can finally transform NYCHA and not continue just to talk about it. So just quickly though, it sounds like you're more open to the RAD program if it's communicated well and, and done with, um, with residents. Yes I, yeah, yeah, yes, I am. Uh, I believe when you look at a combination of, as I stated, uh, selling the air rights with local community-based organizations with a real uh, purpose in mind, if you educate uh, the tenants on exactly what RAD is, if you go to the average tenant there and you speak to them and say, what is RAD? What would it do to, for your community? Uh, you. How do we transform it? No one has given them the time of speaking with them. And I know how they feel about these issues Thank because you. I'm on the ground and I speak with them on one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not going to We're gonna... take to tenants. I Thank want you. tenants to be part of We're... the transformation. We're gonna go to Joycelyn Taylor. Uh, same question to you about NYCHA, uh, how your administration would invest and please address RAD at some point, go ahead. Okay, well, first and foremost, thank you to um, Ben and HCC again for putting this together. You know, as a former NYCHA resident myself, this issue is something that is very near and dear to me. It's something that I take personally. And I think that now is the time for us to, to understand the value of the NYCHA residents and really look out for them. So we need to reinvest in NYCHA. We've divested in NYCHA and for so long, it's time to reinvest. And when we do that reinvestment, I wanted to include ownership opportunities for NYCHA residents. Because if we want to talk about equity and stability, how you create that is through ownership. We should not be talking about a, a process of going through RAD where we're looking at letting developers and people who are always already making money or for the most vulnerable in the city to make more money. That's not the way to go. We have to invest. One of the things that we can do for the tenants is we can give them ownership opportunities, which will allow them to have the ability to not just have stable housing, but it will also generate revenue for the city as it relates to making repairs. I grew up in pink houses myself. There's 1,500 apartments there. If we just took a third of those apartments and we sold them to the tenants between $100,000 and $250,000, we could raise $92 million just like that. So we have to think outside the box and we have to think about ways that we can truly create equity and stability for these tenants. The city of New York needs to get out of the business of being a landlord because it's the worst landlord there is. They need to look at either getting private uh, management for NYCHA or giving the tenants the ability to manage NYCHA themselves because they right. know firsthand the things they're going through. To, to get to uh, tens of billions of dollars, um, what else needs to be part of the equation of funding NYCHA beyond what you mentioned there? I think what we need to include is a, a reinvestment from the federal government that definitely needs to happen. Listen, every day we're investing in the city, state and federal government. Everyone should see a return on that investment and we have to set our priorities to ensure that housing is a is a basic right and that's done first. Um, and then also we can look at the capital budget. We can't do things that are nice to have until we take care of the needs of the people. And so, and will you say a little bit more about your thoughts on RAD on the, on the rental administration uh, program? I don't, I'm not a fan of RAD. I think if we're going to give ownership to anyone, it should be those tenants. A lot of those tenants have been living there for generations, 30 and 40 years. If you look at how much money they spent in NYCHA, you have your civil servants working there. My dad was a bus driver. It's time for them to get a return on that investment. Why are we always looking to first let people who already have money make more money? Let's create legacy and wealth for the NYCHA tenants by giving them the opportunity to own. I don't think RAD is the way to go. Thank you. And we're going to go to uh, Catherine Garcia. Uh, I mentioned in the introduction a couple of the roles uh, that Catherine Garcia held recently in the de Blasio administration, but also uh, chair of NYCHA uh, as an interim position. Uh, so Ms. Garcia, uh, go ahead. Uh, from personal recent experience, especially, um, what do you think NYCHA needs? And as mayor, how would you invest there? 
Uh, thank you so much for having me uh, to both you and to HCC and for all of the great work that you do. NYCHA doesn't need a new plan. NYCHA needs us to start executing on the plans we have. We know that housing equals healing and that health and housing are linked. And being inside NYCHA was somewhat horrifying. There were rat infested buildings. The elevators rarely worked. Uh, kitchens were not in great shape. And I will say that I was very supportive of RAD because when I went and saw developments that had gone through the RAD process in Ocean Bay or at Campos 2, the tenants were extremely happy. They would show off their bathrooms. They would take you on a tour of their new kitchens. Uh, they were very enthusiastic about what their new home looked like and talked about being able to have Thanksgiving dinner there for the first time. NYCHA needs north of $40 billion. We cannot fund that solely out of the city's capital budget without being unable to fund our schools or our water supply system or any of the other things that we need from parks as well, libraries. These will all be competing. NYCHA has to be invested in. We need to be very strategic. So I am supportive of anything that drives money into tenants' apartments. We should not be surprised that after what 40 years of underinvesting in NYCHA that and not putting any oil into the car engine that many things blow, blew up. Uh, I wanna see, I mean, I spent a lot of time with the tenant association presidents and what they were talking about in terms of their needs. And I do agree that with, there needed to be more conversation during RAD about what the implications were for tenants but there are very strong, almost like really identical rights in those leases as they have with NYCHA. And so, they were negotiated with like the Legal Aid Society and other advocates to make sure the protections were as strong as if they were a public housing tenant directly. So, um, so that's obviously a, a distinction on RAD there. How else do you think, you know, that's, that's one source of revenue potentially for NYCHA or currently is a potential revenue raiser if it's expanded, but how else do you think um, the city and NYCHA working together can get to the tens of billions of dollars that are needed? I'm also very supportive of the current chair's thinking on using tenant protection vouchers to create a housing trust to drive more capital dollars into other developments. Uh, it really is actually very similar to what the structure of our water supply system. The city uh, owns the water supply system but leases it to the water board that then hires DEP uh, to do the work and is able to float bonds. It's a very stable structure that gets capital dollars as quickly as possible into those facilities. So I think it's a very good idea to move forward with that. Obviously the city has already made billions of dollars in commitment to NYCHA uh, over the course of the next 10 years. There's at least $3 billion, if not more. But I would like to bring NYCHA into sort of more of the family of agencies. One of the things I found when I was there, and this is a bit of an aside, uh, you know, garbage briefly, is always, please, briefly. garbage is always is always a challenge at NYCHA. And I would go to developments, and they would say, "Well, we don't get enough dump tickets." And I'm like, "I'm the sanitation commissioner. I give you the dump tickets. I'm telling you, there is no cap." Uh, but the feeling in there was there was always a shortage that didn't actually really exist, uh, but was sort of a myth that hung on. So making sure that all the agencies Thank are more in partner with NYCHA. Okay. Thank you. Maya Wiley, uh, we're moving on to you, your, your administration and its plans to invest in NYCHA. What would that look like? And if you can please address your thoughts on RAD in, the, in your answer, go ahead. Oh, unmute first. Trying to save you from my cat noises. 
So uh, let's just start with the fact that we housing is and is a human right, and we need to treat NYCHA as part of that human right, and that we need permanently affordable in this city, because we can't have a city in which we all can live and stay with dignity if we don't have permanently affordable that's also safe and healthy. And so NYCHA has to be a key part of that comprehensive policy. And I would just note that while it is true that the formal census of NYCHA at 400,000 uh, is, is the formal census, we know it's more like 600,000 because affordable housing is such a problem that we have folks doubling up in NYCHA. And we should confront that because we also have a long waiting list for NYCHA. So let's start with the fact that we must, as everyone said, and in different ways, but we must preserve NYCHA, but I say we must preserve it as public. Uh, and a big concern that NYCHA residents themselves are raising is the role that RAD plays in, in, in enabling the preservation of the housing as public. We do need a creative set of investments. We are not going to be able to do $40 billion in the absence of any federal funding we have to confront and be honest about that because not only has it been disinvested in for decades, but we are looking at an average budget deficit because of the revenue crisis we have uh, that we need to talk about filling. But even if we get help from Albany and the federal government on that, we're still gonna be facing in the out years for the next three years, some deficit. So we need federal help. We also need state partnership, but we also have to be creative, including pulling on our capital budget. I agree with that. And we also have to be creative by pulling residents into a process that says, it's all on the table. Let's put all these ideas on the table and let's have a process that gives you voice, but also with the data and information that enables you to make an informed decision that informs ultimately how the city does this, because it is one of the number one complaints I've heard from NYCHA residents is they're not given that transparency, they're not given that, that voice, and therefore they don't have the options to say what it is they want. Say just a little bit more on your thoughts on RAD. You know, we've, you know, now that we're getting towards the end of our first round here, we've heard some differing opinions. So um, just a little bit more of what your impression of the program is at this point and, and how open you'd be to, to an expansion. Well, look, you know, I, I think this is part of what we have to do with residents because I've heard disagreement, but the principles have to be about keeping public housing public. And that's one of the concerns around RAD. We already, and I think you kind of alluded to it, this issue of the fact that we even in RAD houses had some ten tenants signing away some of their protections because the Section 8 vouchers were being treated as vouchers that was, they were getting it as, as is meaning they were giving up some of their ability to have voice in the protection of the health and safety of those apartments. So we do need to find ownership models and we do need to have governance models that ensure that it's Thank both you. public, but that we have lots of options. Thank you. Scott Stringer, City Controller, uh, your thoughts on how your mayoral administration would invest in NYCHA and please address Rad in your answer, go ahead. Well, let me also start out by just thanking you for giving me this opportunity and to my friends at HCC, uh, I'm really glad to be here as a mayoral candidate, but I've been a guest speaker over the last 15 years. So thank you for doing this forum and to my colleagues and Ben. Look, growing up in Washington Heights, not far from Dykeman Houses, uh, I remember when NYCHA developments were aspirational housing. There was no difference between where the kids lived because NYCHA had open space and people, city workers lived there and raised families. and. That was the point of NYCHA going back to Mayor LaGuardia when he built the first NYCHA development. It was for people to come to the city in this country and for existing people to get a NYCHA apartment and then raise families. It was actually aspirational housing. And over the last decades, we've seen massive divestment from the NYCHA model and from 400,000 tenants in New York City who call NYCHA home. They built our neighborhoods, created the daycare centers in a way of life we have divested from this mission. If you think about just since 2001, through Democratic and Republican federal administrations, NYCHA has been on the back burner, left to die on the vine. When you go to Ingersoll houses, as Borough President Adams knows, you see across the street, the luxury development, but you see Ingersoll sort of wasting in the background because there's no investment. So the first thing the next mayor has to do, it's time to go to the federal government and say, look, we give you $22 billion more than we get back. 
And we need a real infrastructure bill and federal package to finally invest in NYCHA. If we don't get it, we will then be forced into stopgap measures while we watch NYCHA slowly sink. The thing that we have going for us is the spirit of the NYCHA tenants and residents. I've done 15 investigations of NYCHA more than any controller in history. And the spirit cannot be broken in NYCHA, but you know what? The agency management is. It's a disgrace. Time and time again, the things that we should be doing, we can't even give them basic services. Two follow-ups for you, controller. First one, uh, your thoughts on RAD. Uh, do, you, do you see RAD as, a, as part of the future of NYCHA? Should it be considered for expansion or what do you think of it? Look, I think we, every time we move to privatize public housing, you know, it, 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 it comes with a sense that, that we have failed and that we will not have the kind of rights for tenants that we would in a public setting. But when we look at the different models we're forced to use right now, it's because of the lack of investment on a federal level. One idea that I think we should put forth immediately is to take $40 million a year over 10 years from the Battery Park City Authority it's an idea that I support with Governor Cuomo. If we did that, we could bond that money as a way of creating a new revenue stream for NYCHA. It would not solve the crisis, but we also have to look for new revenue streams. Can't just rely on the private sector. There are ways to do this. If the mayor were to support my plan, Thank we'd you. already be investing more in NYCHA. Thank you. And to round out our first round here that's focused on NYCHA, we're gonna to go to Sean Donovan, uh, who has uh, also has firsthand experience on this topic. Uh, the question, Mr. Donovan, is how would your mayoral administration invest in NYCHA? And as part of that, where do you see the RAD program fitting in? Go ahead. Thanks, Ben, it's great to see you. And uh, Richard, to all the incredible work at HCC that uh, we've done over the years to the West Side Neighborhood Alliance, uh, it's great to be with you again. Look, let's be very clear that public housing in New York City is the single most precious affordable housing resource that we have, and we finally need a mayor who treats it that way. More than one in 14 New Yorkers live in public housing. That's more than live in the city of Atlanta. And so as mayor, first and foremost, I would bring NYCHA to the center of our housing efforts, and finally, for the first time ever, make it part of the city's housing plan. Second, we have to be very clear that I am the only candidate in this race who has actually worked with housing authorities around this country to turn house public housing around. San Francisco public housing was in worse shape than NYCHA. And I worked closely with a very strong mayor who was deeply invested. And we turned that housing authority around. We can do that with NYCHA too, with the right leadership in city hall. I had, in fact, I've been working with the residents of public housing for the last three years to bring them together with public housing leaders around the, the country to show that there are models, innovative new models that we can pursue to revitalize NYCHA and finally give NYCHA residents the housing that they deserve. Again, what this is gonna take is substantially increased investment. And, and with all due respect to the other candidates, there is no way that we're gonna to get to the $40 billion that we need without the help from Washington that we need. And no one is in a better position to work together with Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who I've sat side by side with and worked with day after day. And nobody's in a better position to work with members of Congress who I know well and have worked with again over years to get us the help that we need. So um, we the, ran a the little last bit. thing I would just say, and nobody else has mentioned this, we should recognize that if we put the dollars that we NYCHA deserves, we can put NYCHA residents, primarily black and brown residents who have been left behind for too long, back to work by creating uh, programs that create apprenticeships, working with our uh, labor union uh, friends and making sure that we have the kind of jobs and economic future that NYCHA residents deserve. So you went mostly into our, our back and forth time there. That's okay. The, this in the last few seconds, um, when you say innovative models, I don't I don't think we quite got where you think RAD fits in that. And if you want to name two or three of what you think those innovative models are, but but really just name yeah. them. We can't go into explanations right now. Go ahead. So two things. As this forum shows, there's deep misunderstanding about RAD. RAD does not require privatization. It is a way to get Section 8 resources 
into public housing, just like the preservation trust idea. So we need a, a reset on RAD. Okay. We need to make sure a mayor works. The other thing I would say is we should be using sustainability measures in an innovative way to raise capital. Why shouldn't we have solar panels on every roof in NYCHA okay. that could not only lower utility bills, but put capital back into public housing? Okay, we're gonna to move to our second round of questions, but first uh, we have actually a couple of minutes left in uh, the time for, for the beginning here. So I just wanna um, ask if anybody, and, and we won't be able to get to everybody, but nobody mentioned infill development that I heard. Does anybody want to jump in and say they are in favor of development on underused NYCHA land to bring in new housing? If anybody is in favor of that, uh, jump in right now for a quick 30 seconds. Go ahead. And I think if it's done in right Okay, so let's hold on. Uh, Sean Donovan, let's wait one second. Yes. I, I, I'm Go ahead, Borough President. I am in support of infield development if it's done in a certain way. Number one, the new units that are built on nature uh, property, it does not impact uh, the green space, but at the same time, those new units would allow pre-existing tenants to right size their apartments, move into the new units, and then allow new tenants to uh, go inside. We have too many tenants that are okay. in large units because they don't want to be displaced. Okay. And uh, I think Catherine Garcia, you wanted to jump in, go ahead. I too support infill development at NYCHA in part to make it so that those tenants on NYCHA property can move into new apartments quickly and also to generate money so that we can rehab the other apartments that are part of that development. My Wiley. We have a, a continued need for more housing <laughs> stock in general. Thank you. Yeah, I said it was all on the table because the question is where and how. It is something that has to be done with residents as part of the decision making and the governance of that that also determines what that infill housing is for home and what its impact is on our ability to also ensure that we're investing in the existing uh, NYCHA facility. Sean Donovan. When we have a desperate affordable housing shortage in this city, we need to look at these types of options. And I think in particular, to build housing targeted at the needs of seniors, we have an aging population that desperate needs better services in NYCHA, build more senior housing. That's Thank an enormous you. opportunity and make sure residents aren't displaced when we have to do full rehabilitation of buildings next door. Scott Stringer, did you want to say something uh, in support of the possibility of infill? Well, first of all, I, I got a little disconnected because of uh, the Wi-Fi, so it's just wait to be back. Uh, let me let me just say this is yeah, this is just for su potential support for infill development on underutilized land in tw twenty seconds on that. You know, this started in the Bloomberg administration, and when I said to them, "Well, how are you going to assess the development project?" It seems to me it should go through a, a land use process, the ULIP process. They weren't interested. Any time that we touch land that is equity owned by tenants of NYCHA. We need to have a land use process that involves a discussion and a land use process by which tenants can participate. It can't just be a government's way or the highway. Diane Morales, a quick thought. Yeah, I, I, I wanna sort of piggyback on that actually. Um, you know, no one's talked about tenants or the residents of, of NYCHA and mm -hmm. Universally, they're they're against this idea of building in, in on the infill. So I, you know, I think we need to prioritize what the communities want and really partner with the residents of NYCHA in order to make any kinds of decisions about what's happening in those developments. And this is not it. Joyce Lynn. Yes, Taylor. and I would have to agree with that. And I have, I think that we need to remember that anything that we implement is not one size fits all. And I think that's where we go down the wrong path, trying to give the same thing to everybody. Everybody has different needs and wants, and we need to meet people where they're at. But I think it's something that really needs to be ha needs to have a lot of input from the residents, um, and they need to be able to buy in into it and be on board and show them and my, add to them. Lastly, Carlos Menchak on this topic. I'm gonna agree with Diane. Uh, the residents have to be front and center on all these issues, but they do not want infill. They do not want it. Okay. Uh, and let's keep going. Next question to everybody. Um, and we're gonna actually start this round uh, with Catherine Garcia and then go in the same order we went. So this round will go uh, Catherine Garcia to Maya Wiley and so on and finish with Joyce Lynn Taylor. We're gonna start different rounds with different folks. So Catherine Garcia, this question to you. 
by uh, 2021 and, and then into 2022, when uh, you would potentially take over as mayor, we could be seeing the severe consequences of COVID on privately owned buildings and their tenants, foreclosures, delayed repairs, consolidation of ownership as a result, the result of financial struggles. What would your administration do to combat these potential issues with the privately owned housing stock? Go ahead. I apologize, I was muted. Uh, as I said before, housing really is about healing. And as we're going through this incredible economic shock, uh, as the city moves forward from this, there are struggles for landlords, there are struggles for tenants. We know that repairs are not happening. We know that there could be foreclosures coming up. This is an opportunity though for the city to do two things. One is to really bring together the private sector and help them work with their bankers to make sure that those <laughs> units are not foreclosed upon. Uh, they have a vested interest in ensuring that those buildings stabilize and move forward. Because certainly we don't, the city should definitely always be the, the landlord of last resort that has not worked well in the past in the in-rim process. Uh, but we need to be able to begin to create funding streams that support them. And I think using the private sector to come in and help support that is critical because the city honestly will not have large amounts of money going into 2021. And uh, for this round, we're not going to do a lot of back and forth because we, we did a lot on NYCHA. So uh, we're going to go to Maya Wiley here on the privately owned uh, building stock. Um, how would you look to combat some of the issues uh, mentioned here, including the issues of foreclosures, delayed repairs, consolidation of ownership potentially? Um, what would you look to be doing about the private sector there? Yeah, I mean, let's start with the fact that we have a homeless crisis that's a historic one in size, and it's because we need to understand it as an eviction crisis, right? And so we have to do several different things when we think about uh, private owners. One, we have to recognize that we have and must uh, find a way to ensure that the 400,000 New Yorkers that are currently, currently facing eviction at the end of this year, and that doesn't even count the 200,000 who were already in the pipeline for eviction before COVID hit, that we have to do something that's both around discussions with Albany around moratorium, rent subsidy, and all the things that helps keep people there. And we can't forget the legal right to counsel because we know that we actually saw for tenants who had lawyers, 84%, 84% were saved from eviction. So all of those tools matter, including the enforcement tools that city government should bring. But let's also say that we have an opportunity here because the eviction crisis is also an affordability crisis and a crisis in not having enough affordable housing. So using, using the opportunities for the city to buy up, for example, shuttered hotels <laughs> and finding the resources, that's an investment that actually helps us solve an affordability problem. That also means we can get folks paying rent that also brings money back into our coffers. And we should think about it in that kind of a comprehensive way. Thank you, Scott Stringer on the privately owned housing stock. Go ahead. Well, just to put things into perspective, you know, pre-COVID in February, we had a city unemployment rate of 3.4%. We had added 970,000 new jobs over 10 years and once we saw the onset of the virus, that unemployment rate went from 3% to 20% and communities of color much higher. And we lost 900,000 jobs. And as a result, we see a lot of vacant commercial space and a real estate market that is facing foreclosure. This represents to me an opportunity that we should not miss. We should take advantage of this by using land banks and community trusts to purchase these buildings, turn them into affordable housing or limited equity co-ops, this model, the social housing model, is one that I pushed before it had a name. It was called the Mitch Lama Housing Program and how we could create opportunity for working people. And I think this is a time to do that. We should also start purchasing uh, these properties and, and continue to work on what is already in place, which is called the Neighborhood Pillars Program. It's uh, a program that is supposed to allow not-for-profits to purchase properties, to convert them to affordable residential. This is an opportunity that we should double down on with our not-for-profits 
And that's how I would approach this. This is a terrible tragedy for so many people, but it is an opportunity to rethink the housing structures, as Maya said, with our hotels that are abandoned and other places. This is the way to do this in a very comprehensive approach to bring affordability to the forefront of rebuilding our city. Thank you. Sean Donovan on the privately owned housing stock in the city. Go ahead. Thanks, Ben. Look, we have to recognize that in less than a month, we are going to have a national eviction moratorium that expires while President Trump is still in office. We are staring down potentially the most severe housing crisis the city has seen since the Great Recession. And we need to act immediately to extend that moratorium and to get tens of billions of dollars of rental assistance into the hands of New Yorkers who are literally afraid that they won't, will be out on the streets in the next four weeks. So that has to be the priority. And in fact, even as recently as yesterday, I was on the phone with leaders in Congress helping them craft a package. The 25 billion that was proposed is not enough. We need to do more, more like the 100 billion that I worked with Maxine Waters and other leaders on over the summer, but we have to get that funding to avoid this eviction crisis. What we also need to do though, is make sure, as Maya said, that we are investing much more aggressively in legal aid, in counseling that keeps people in their homes. And in fact, in the last housing crisis, I led the creation of the Center for New York City Neighborhoods, which did exactly that. And as housing secretary, I was able to win dramatic new investments in legal aid, and counseling assistance to keep people in their homes. Finally, we need a proactive preservation strategy in this city that targets with an early warning system, which buildings and residents are gonna be at risk so that we reach them before they end up on the streets and shelter. Carlos Menchaca, over to you. Uh, the issues again, the, the privately owned housing stock, coming potential foreclosures, delayed repairs, consolidation of ownership, go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, for this question. We're talking about the renters of New York City. And we, many of us uh, are, are renters in the city. Here, here's what I'm going to, I'm going to put out because I think, I think a lot of the ideas that we're hearing right now are, are, are good. Legal services are good. I was really happy that the city council really took leadership uh, from the communities about bringing more lawyers. The certificate of no harassment, something we talked around the industry city ULERP that the city needed to focus on preserving people's uh, uh, housing housing rights in, in, in Sunset Park. These are all things that the, fa the city failed to do when we asked them to. We need to put more resources on all of that. But I think what we also need to do is think about the link between the question of why people are, are homeless, why people are being evicted, they don't have the dollars right now. A pilot, a universal basic income pilot uh, would be a perfect way to test this out in the city and not wait to 2022, we can do it right now in this budget. Uh, and I know people are asking, how are we gonna fund all these things? The question is how we're gonna prioritize what we're gonna be funding uh, in the next six months when we pass the budget. Uh, the moratorium has to be a, a focus for us. And so I'm standing with, with renters right now to ensure that people stay in their homes. Uh, I'll pause there. Okay, thank you. And Diane Morales, same question to you. Uh, let me know if you want me to repeat any of it, but, but I think you're ready, so go ahead. Thanks, Ben. Um, you know, I, I think really what we're talking about here is, is housing is the basic human right, um, but it's also, a, a, a we're talking about a public health issue and a critical social determinant of physical and, and mental health. So, so there's the immediate crisis where first and foremost, we need to think about how we're gonna cancel rent for tenants and, and people that are unable to pay their rent over the course of the pandemic. And as a result of the pandemic, we need to think about providing reimbursements and targeted relief funds to, to small homeowners and, and housing owners. Um, we also need to think about the, you know, pushing the banking industry to forgive mortgage payments from, from qualifying homeowners um, and really ceasing the eviction process until we can really get through this, this current emergency and ensure that residents of temporary housing in particular are also not displaced. But the bottom line, and this goes to, to Carlos's point, is that too much of the housing sector, the, of the housing market is part of the market sector and not, and not enough of it is a social sector initiative that provides permanently protected housing that is excluded from rising prices. The, our fundamental goal, I think, has to be to shift housing 
and, and the associated economic development away from the dominance of profits and towards a model of social housing that really treats housing as a human right and provides residents with the dignity and respect that they deserve. Thank you. Borough President Adams, we're uh, going over to you for this question about the privately owned housing stock in the city, uh, issues around foreclosures that could be looming, delayed repairs because people don't uh, haven't been investing or haven't had the funds to invest and potential consolidation of ownership. Go ahead. So, uh, you know, this is not a uh, professional story for me. This is a personal story. I know what housing insecurity uh, is about. Uh, I remember as, as a child going to school every day with a garbage bag full of clothing uh, because we thought we were going to be thrown out of our home. And my mom did not want us to uh, have, not have a change of clothing. So this is real. And it's also real with my tenants. I have a small three uh, family house. Uh, my tenant fell on hard times. She could not pay her rent for a year. And the city told me, take her to court and then we will give her emergency repairs and uh, emergency assistance. And I said, no, I'm not going to destroy her credit. I'm going to work with her and I'm gonna wait before she could get on her feet uh, to be able to pay. So several things I would do. Number one, partner with the district attorney's office. It is a crime to destroy property and throw people out. Uh, it's, a, it's a crime for illegal evictions. It's a crime to burn property, to displace tenants. We need to look at the criminal behavior of the illegal acting landlords and we need to prosecute them. We're too slow in doing so. I will move in the direction uh, to make sure that happens. Second, Mitchell Lama Task Force. My Mitchell Lama Task Force, we were successful and helped secure $250 million from the city to save more than 15,000 subsidized units from market rates. Very important to do so. Third, Technology, I keep talking about this. I started my law enforcement career. I was a police officer special assignment, started to turn around the crime in the city. We need real time governance. We sat down with HPD, DHCR, housing court, and we wanted to put in a green, yellow, red system to immediately identify with a, a home owner or a property owner or a tenant, I should say, was in, in the area of being in a danger zone of losing our precious affordable houses. Thank it was you. unbelievable the bureaucracy. We could get nothing done as have the to, that is have not to leave it there, but we, we definitely got the, the gist of that idea. Thank you. Uh, Joycelyn Taylor, to, to round out this round, uh, your thoughts on, on the private uh, privately owned housing stock. Yeah, and I'm gonna round it out and I'm probably gonna round it out very simplistically. Here's the thing, we're in a pandemic. We're in unprecedented times. We're in a time where we have asked people to stay at home. We're in a time where we have asked people to be responsible and do certain things, in addition to wearing masks and other things. When we've asked people to do those things and they've complied, then the government has an obligation to make sure that people remain whole. People have done what we've asked. This pandemic is not something that was brought upon by any of us. So every day we have people who are investing in this city, in this state, in this federal government. In this moment, the answer to me is for the government to take that money that we've invested and utilize it for the people and make it whole. People shouldn't have to go through the stress of getting an attorney to fight for their rights. Go get the money, give it to the people so that they can live their lives stress-free and maintain their apartments. The people did what we, what we asked them to do. So we have to do our part as government. And part of what we do should not be purchasing the properties of people or landlords who have abide by what we ask because now they can't pay. The government should be a support to people in this moment and that's what people need. And landlords need that as well. Thank you. Okay, we're going on to our third round of questions here. We're gonna start this round with Diane Morales. So be ready to kick things off first, please. And, and again, same order here. So it'll go Diane Morales, Eric Adams, and so on. Uh, and we're just trying to mix it up uh, to make sure people aren't stuck in the same spot in the rotation each time. So um, this will come to Diane Morales first, and we're moving on more directly to homelessness. Obviously these issues are all, all very tied together and, and should be and should be in, in your discussion of them. but. Uh, more directly on homelessness and making sure that the city does a better job of housing people of the lowest incomes, people below, let's say, 
30% of area median income or even 10% of area median income, preventing low income folks from becoming homeless or making sure that if people are in the shelter system, they then can get out into housing that, that they can afford. So what would your administration do to house low, the lowest income people, people making under 30%, let's say, of area median income or 10%? Uh, Diane Morales, please start us off. Yeah, okay, great. Um, so I'm gonna start with the, with the, the low income folks. Um, and I think, you know, part of what I was talking up about before when I was talking about a social housing model is actually a model that is intended to provide housing for everyone, no matter what their, what their income is. Um, I, I think we need to move to a, a system where we are facilitating tenant, nonprofit, and public acquisition of, of distressed rental buildings, and really start to create a pipeline for social housing development, um, including co continuing to expand tenant protections and code enforcement, and you really using tax policies to curb the speculative behavior by, by landlords and, and lenders. Um, I, I also think that we need to think about creating these you know, social housing, cooperative housing developments that would include other resources for, that are needed in communities like childcare and public spaces, health clinics, et cetera. But in so far as the uh, the homeless population, as someone who operated shelters um, for the last decade, I can tell you that our system is fundamentally flawed. Um, it is focused solely on moving people out of the, sh the shelter system and not actually providing them with the supports that they need in order to be able to attain and maintain stable housing over the long term. And so we end up with a cycle of people being pushed out of the, the shelter system because that's what the shelter system rewards is placement. Um, but the reality of it is that those people are not placed in housing in such a way that they're able to actually maintain it. Um, and so we need, to, we need to think about that. We need to exercise eminent domain so we can access vacant real estate space. There's plenty of vacant housing across the city. Everybody should have a roof over Thank their heads. And we should repurpose vacant commercial spaces as needed to provide Thank stable housing. I'll stop. Eric, Eric Adams, over to you. Uh, thank you. First of all, when we look at homelessness, we need to stop viewing it as uh, one size fits all. It falls into three categories for the most part, uh, children and families, a single adult of uh, adults, single adults, and those who are dealing with uh, real mental health illnesses. And we need to have an approach that would address each one of them. First, of all, look, let's look at children and, and families. We made a big mistake when we cut the budget from the Advantage program. Over 40 million came from the state, 40 million, over 40 million came from the city, and over 40 million came from the federal government. Uh, once we cut that program, homelessness spiked in one year. We need to reinstitute that type of program where we say to families, instead of having you lose your homes and go into a shelter, let's keep you inside your homes and support that. Second, single adults. We, as has been mentioned, uh, we have a countless number of shelters and the a countless number of hotels in the outer boroughs that was the market was already oversaturated. I say let's retrofit those uh, units. Let's change our SRO laws. Let's allow uh, the proper building of small apartments so we could ensure that those single adults can have a place to stay with wraparound service within the location, not shelters but real apartments for them at an affordable rate. Third, uh, mental health. We made a big mistake when uh, we dealt with what happened in, on, Staten Island, on Staten Island with Willowbrook. It was a knee-jerk reaction. We have a revolving door process on street homelessness, which is overwhelmingly men and women who are dealing with mental health crisis. They're afraid to go into Thank shelters. You. We need to support them, not allow them to go to Bellevue, get medicine for one day, and then put them back into the street. We know who the frequent flyers are. They're great programs. My office has been partnering Thank with, you. communicating with, that they're able to Joyce, give wraparound services. Joyce and Taylor, we're, we're coming over to you. Thank you, Borough President. Uh, it's, it's particularly, the question is focused on housing the lowest income uh, workers, people, 30% of area median income, let's say, and then and then even lower than that. Go ahead. Make sure you unmute yourself there. Well, we do a lot of data and analysis 
on you know how much people make in this city. And if we want to be able to provide housing for people who are on the lower income, we have to actually just build that housing. Um, we have to have an investment in the city to uh, support the cost of building that housing with the understanding that once you do give people housing, you don't have to give them housing again. When we talk about the issue of um, homelessness, if you want to address homelessness, you address homelessness by giving homeless people addresses. And you get away from this system where people, in order to be able to get a, a, an, a decent apartment or be able to afford an apartment, have to go into a shelter to qualify for Section 8 or to qualify for an uh, a affordable ap apartment. We have to get away from that process. And we also have to understand that homelessness has somewhat even become a business. You know, I, I do a town hall every week and I had a young lady on the town hall on homelessness that's been living in a shelter for five years. We have 60,000 homeless people in the city. We're spending $3.2 billion a year, which, which is about $53,000 per person. So in five years, we've spent $265,000 to keep a person in a homeless shelter. We have to not just give the money and support, but we have to figure, look at how we're utilizing that money and make sure we utilize it in a way that creates long-term stable housing for people. Thank you. Catherine Garcia, over to you on uh, how to best house people who are low income. Thank you. Uh, I, I, think, I think that's the best line yet, Jocelyn, to address homelessness, we need to give them an address. Uh, I too think that we need to be focused on the very low income and use our subsidy money when we are building to do 30% or less of the AMI for most folks who are homeless, it is an economic problem. They can't pay the rent. And getting them in to an apartment is absolutely critical. There is, as the borough president said, a group of homeless folks who do suffer from mental illness. We need to build 10,000 units of supportive housing or safe haven beds. And for those who are very, very resistant to going into shelter, and I've spent time dealing with that over the course of my career at sanitation. We need to have drop-in centers to facilitate creating the trust bonds that we know they need in order to accept service. So it's a broad-based program, but one of the other things that's just structural, uh, the folks who run the homeless agencies report to different deputy mayors than the people who build the housing or run NYCHA, that needs to be one seamless situation where the goals are the same for uh, the house, the homeless housing commissioner, as it is for um, as it is for the economic development president or the HPD commissioner. They all need to be on the same page to drive down the amount of homelessness and to make sure those apartments are opening up for those families. But I also would say we need to be creative with our zoning as well as with what is happening in the sector on commercial and hotels and grab them up if we can. Thank you. Uh, Maya Wiley, over to you on the best ways to house uh, people making, let's say around 30% of area median income or below. Well, let me just start by saying that someone I love very dearly, who is uh, very dear to my family, is a young man who was homeless. And by the way, public housing is what got them out of their homelessness condition. So I wanna reference what we said about public housing, but I also wanna say we're still struggling to help him through school because he was so traumatized by his experience with homelessness. And I say this because homelessness is a construct. It is something we created, which means it is something we can solve. And it starts with creating more affordable housing. And to your point, more affordable housing for very low and extremely low income people, that means one thing that we have to do, that I have talked to the men of the Lucerne, uh, some of whom, many of whom are housing ready, as it's called, but they have $1,200 a month in a voucher that can get them absolutely no housing. And so they languish in shelter because we haven't invested sufficiently in that voucher. And we spend $2 billion on what? Shelters. And we spend, I think it's 50, 150 million 
on, on, on the subsidy structure. We need to start investing in a higher subsidy so that folks can afford the housing and get out of shelters and flip this system on its head. The other thing though that we have to do is create more affordability and that does mean more partnership with not-for-profit housing developers, in addition to more creative things that we've already talked about, like using using our uh, city funds Thank to you. make sure we're buying up hotels. Thank you. Scott Stringer? We need to build real low-income housing, finally. LaGuardia did it, as we mentioned today, with NYCHA. We saw what could happen with the Michelama housing that was built. The de Blasio administration went to revenue developers and they said, here's the deal. We'll give you more density. We'll give you more access to communities of color through our rezonings if you build me 30% affordable housing. The problem is that that affordable housing is unaffordable to almost every community the housing was created in. The rezonings gentrified neighborhoods and added to the homeless crisis. So we need to have a housing program that actually builds low-income housing, not affordable housing, low-income housing. The fight between de Blasio and Bloomberg as to who was building more quote-unquote affordable housing, it wasn't really affordable. So my plan would do the following. I would access the thousand vacant parcels of land in this city that the city owned. I would give that land back to the people. I would give it to community-based organizations, provide a subsidy by increasing a progressive more, uh, transfer, real property transfer tax that would raise hundreds of millions of dollars. I would then say, you build this housing and you build it for the people who need it the most. We move 30% of the people working in homeless shelters into this kind of housing. Second, we also have to stop rezoning only in communities of color and recognize if we're gonna integrate our city and build out a new generation of affordable housing, we have to look at as of right development. And I've proposed that 25% of units in as of right development be set aside for affordable housing. So you catch it two ways in as of right Thank development you. and in terms of accessing our city owned property. And that's Thank what I would propose to, we, we have to change this and stop fighting on the edges because we're losing this fight in so many of our challenged economic, uh, economically challenged communities. Thank you. Sean Donovan coming to you, uh, especially on the issue of preventing homelessness or making sure there's enough affordable apartments for people coming out of homelessness who are lower income, go ahead. Well, Ben, first of all, you know, we, we talk in these abstract terms about who folks are. Let's let's be real about this. When you say 10% of AMI or 30%, what we're talking about is families making ten to fifteen thousand dollars a year in New York City. And let's be real about this too. The cruel math of affordable housing is that you could subsidize every single dollar of building an apartment and still a family couldn't afford just the operating expenses of those, uh, those units. So what we really need to do here is have a conversation about rental assistance and how we get that in the hands of families. We need to dramatically increase uh, Section 8 vouchers in this country. That's why when I was budget director, I proposed a $10 billion increase. It's why I've been working with Joe Biden and his team on their proposal for universal voucher accessibility, because let's face it, one in four eligible people in this city gets a voucher. That's simply not enough. But we also need to change our city's rental assistance program. Think about this, right now, you have to go to housing court or go to a shelter to get rental assistance from the city. How wrong is that? You have to disrupt your family and put them at risk to get the help that you need. The third thing though we should be clear about is that even if you have rental assistance, the discrimination that you face, particularly as a black or brown person trying to rent a unit is overwhelming. And as someone who enforced the Fair Housing Act under President Obama, I would aggressively as mayor make sure that the source of income discrimination that the state passed is put into effect. And finally, and I know this is a housing forum, I'd love to talk about my jobs and economic development program to raise those incomes above 10 or $15,000. Thank you. Uh, Carlos Menchaca, uh, lastly, on this round of, of questions uh, on the issue of how to better uh, provide housing for people of lower incomes. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I, I also want to define this, um, this question around who we're talking about. 
And many times we're talking about immigrants. We're talking about people who are working as well and not being able to pay rent. The numbers that the advocates are telling me about and what we've seen in the city council hearings about the number of dollars that we're throwing at this, uh, this issue around housing uh, folks in shelters, it goes up to like $90,000 a year for a person in our shelter system. Why don't we give that to them to be able to go back into the market, find an apartment and stabilize themselves, make sure that we have case management that is actually addressing the needs that they have. Let's try that. This is the kind of opportunity that we have in the city where we're gonna change the city council and the mayor to do something bold and big. Universal basic income is just is an idea. This is how it gets impacted. We also have massive amounts of apartments out there that are vacant uh, in, the, in, the, in the tens of thousands of apartments. Let's bring them into a program so that there's no vacant apartment in the city and we bring people into that. We gotta get out of the idea that shelters are the solution when permanent housing is what people need. That's, that's gonna be a cheaper um, operation to get people back into a stable. Uh, and like, I think it was uh, Commissioner Garcia that said, housing is healing. So let's do that. Thank you. So we're going to move into our, our next round of questions. We're going to start this round with Joycelyn Taylor and then go from there in the same order. So that'll mean uh, Ms. Taylor, then uh, Catherine Garcia and so on. Uh, the question is, uh, and we're going to unfortunately have to sort of cut down a little bit on, on time here. So we're going to um, go to one, one minute instead of minute and a half answers. And, and we want to make sure we're keeping the whole conference uh, on schedule here and everybody else's uh, days. So the question is, if you were mayor today, what immediate steps, things under the city's control would you do to ease the burdens on homeless people right now? Uh, what, are, what are some immediate things, concrete things under the city's control that you would do to try to ease burdens faced by homeless people? Go ahead, Ms. Taylor. Uh, well, one of the things that I would do is want to ensure that they have all of the resources that they need. Um, you know, as it relates to housing and that type of thing, you know, uh, make sure that when we're talking about putting them in, in hotels, they're not, we're not just dropping them in hotels and that's it. That's just not enough to put them in a hotel. So we have to make sure that they have all of the resources that they need. And we also, in, in parallel track, we have to be looking at how we're going to help them long term as well. So looking at, you know, there are a lot of companies that are right now going to have employees that are going to be working from home. We're going to have a lot of office space that's going to be available. You know, it's an opportunity now for us. Let's say, let's take the Daily News, for example. They mentioned that none of their employees are going back. It's an opportunity for us to take those buildings and have those conversations and we can do quick conversions of some of these office spaces to provide more stability and permanency for them in this moment. So those are some of the things that I would be looking at and also doing it in a way that we look at them holistically and we ensure that we're not just giving them a place to live, but like I said, we make sure that we give them the additional resources that they Thank need. You. Catherine Garcia, immediate steps you would take as mayor today to, to ease burdens faced by homeless people in the city? For a homeless family, I immediately give them the money to go and rent an apartment uh, and to get them on their feet. We know there are vacancies right now and availability, so we should be making use of that. It's actually different than almost any time in the history of New York City that we have vacant apartments. Uh, we should be leveraging NYCHA as much as possible to ensure if they have any vacancies. It, we are fixing those vacant apartments so that they are moving ready for homeless families. We should be converting office towers and beginning that process like we did in Lower Manhattan after 9-11 and working on changing our laws around hotels to ensure that there are services for people who are homeless, who are street homeless or suffering from a mental illness. They need services in combination with, with housing. Thank you. Maya Wiley, on to you, uh, immediate steps that you would take if mayor today. Sham, the homeless hero de Barons, and the men of the Lucerne, you stay. Open hearts, Upper West Side, you get lifted up as a model. And we support, in addition to moving more people who are homeless into shelters that are actually former hotels with the services and supports they need, but we invest in bringing communities together to be part of that mutual aid society. And we do everything 
everything in our power to ensure that we are housing folks appropriately to the, their needs. And we open up and bring in the expertise from our community-based organizations and our not-for-profits that are expert in how we do this well, like ensuring we don't have more than 100 people uh, in one place if we need to give them services like drug rehabilitation services. But I will say one other thing. Anyone who wants to come with a lawsuit that says not in my backyard, we say, okay, here we go, court. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Stringer, uh, immediate steps you would take today if mayor to ease burdens on uh, people facing homelessness right now? Bill de Blasio should bring every not-for-profit provider, housing expert into city hall safely and make sure that we take care of the people who are languishing in so many hotels and so many dangerous shelters and through a combination of finance and a combination of compassion and expertise he should be leading this city at a moment of great crisis the mismanagement of this administration who does it really hurt at the end of the day it really hurts the most vulnerable people the way he is taking the people at lucerne the men at the lucerne and moving them around as if they're just collateral damage to a failed mayoral tea and a failed housing plan. And we have to do better. So first of all, no more building unaffordable, affordable housing. No more letting people sit until they can't stand anymore. We've got to begin to manage us in this crisis. And that's what I would do. I would use the power of the mayoral tea to build the partnership necessary to take care of people. Here's what's outrageous. Over 60,000 people, half of them are children, are going to sleep in a homeless shelter. I've done the investigations. Those shelters are dangerous. Thank Kids you. shouldn't be there. What has this administration done to step up and say, not on my watch? That's what we have to do. And Thank we cannot you. do it by using luxury development Sean. as the leverage because it's not working. Sean Donovan, immediate steps uh, you would take today. Well, I want to thank Maya for naming Shams DeBaron and the folks that uh, are out on the streets today because of the actions of this administration. And in fact, I take my don't just take my word for it. Look at what I've done. I entered as an expert witness in that suit to help win a temporary restraining order from an appeals court two days ago in a fight to try to keep folks at the Lucerne working with the Upper West Side Open Hearts Initiative. And, and where does that come from? It, come from? it comes from my growing up in New York City at a time when homelessness was exploding. I went to work in a homeless shelter at college. I, I then went to work in my first job after college at the National Coalition for the Homeless. I've spent 30 years working on this challenge of homelessness and know that homelessness is a solvable challenge. We know how to house anyone. We now has to have to house everyone. The problem is we have a mayor who has a shelter first strategy, who thinks we can solve homelessness with homeless programs. Instead, what we need is permanent supportive housing that brings the services we need. And we need to make sure that every time somebody leaves Rikers, every time someone leaves the mental health wing of a public hospital, the city has a plan to get them the housing and the resources that they need. How do thank I know this can be done? Thank, thank you. I, I have to stop you there. I'm sorry. Radically reduced homelessness across this country. Carlos Menchaca, over to you. Immediate steps you would take as mayor. So one, I'd just show some courage uh, and really confront all these things that have been presented today. One, I would institute a universal basic income pilot. We just talked about that. Get people not just what they need for rent, but for the things that they need to live in the city. Two, I would put a, I, I would create a series of um, movement-based decisions that the mayor can make right now to signal to everyone else that we're serious. One is a moratorium on all rezonings until we have racial impact studies for all of them. Uh, the idea that 25% is going to be enough for affordable housing in any uh, in any kind of ULERP or MIH program is ridiculous. We need to get up to 50 to 100% affordable housing projects across the city. Um, that, as mayor, I would I would advise uh, my 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 cabinet team to do that. I've already been listening to experts that are telling me that the housing crisis has really created a whole new dynamic with how uh, uh, not just the housing but commercial uh, rents are going to be impacted. 
let's study that and relook at everything that's happening. The first thing is just get people money. Thank you. And Diane Morales, over to you. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm going to answer your question about the immediate, um, but I'm not going to do that without emphasizing the fact that no matter what we do to address the immediate crisis, we actually really need to fundamentally commit to an overhaul and transformation of the current system. We don't need higher subsidies or increased rental assistance. What we really need to do is look at the housing crisis and address it at the root so that we're moving away from the commodification, the privatization, and the speculative practices that have resulted in the conditions that we are dealing with today. Um, we could and really should be looking at models from around the world, including places like Vienna, to transform the way we frame and provide access to housing. That being said, I would move immediately to exercise eminent domain over the vacant spaces that exist across the city, including the rep repurposing of commercial spaces, as I've already mentioned. I also think we need to think we need to look at repurposing what are currently being set aside subsidies and tax breaks for developers and use that to house people. Um, and finally, I would say that I think we need to look towards implementing the land value tax that I referenced earlier that disincentivizes land landowners from sitting on private and, and vacant land. Thank you. We're going to finish this round with Eric Adams. We're going to move on to one more final question, which comes from an audience member. So um, there is one more round of answers, but Eric Adams, on steps you would take immediately as mayor, if you were mayor today, to ease thank burdens on, on people facing homelessness right now. Uh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I would uh, really uh, explore some version of the UBI, uni universal base income. Uh, I think that we need to get people over this very difficult time, particularly low income New Yorkers. I would look at the retrofit fitting of hotels uh, and SRO rules right away. And then prevention is a biggie uh, for me. I would reinstitute a program that would prevent people from losing their homes in the first place. And second, and, and lastly, which is extremely important, our babies, our children. Uh, it is embarrassing that we had almost 70,000 children uh, who did not have iPads and a countless number who didn't have Wi-Fi. Uh, we need to get into these shelters in the 21st century, the inability to put in a uh, high-speed broadband is a crime. Anytime we don't educate, we incarcerate. And so I would immediately get these young people the technologies that they need so they don't have a destructive future. Thank you. And so we're going to go into our final round here again, about a minute each. Um, you know, these, these forums are always enlightening. They're also very frustrating because we should have six, seven hours here to talk about all this. And I'm already regretting uh, all the audience questions that we can't get to today, but but thankfully uh, it's December and the election's not until June, so there'll be more, more of these discussions and others. Uh, Scott Stringer, we're gonna start with you on this final question and then go to Sean Donovan and continue on in the same, same order, which means Maya Wiley will get the final word here. Um, so Scott Stringer, to start with you, this comes from Roberto Rodriguez, who says, Hi, uh, I'm a tenant in South Williamsburg and a member of End Warehousing Apartments Coalition. I'd like to know what your administration will do to help our communities stop predatory landlords from warehousing apartments that are vacant for profit. So again, what would your administration do to help communities stop predatory landlords from warehousing apartments that are vacant for profit? Go ahead, Scott Stringer. I would have, as mayor, I would have zero tolerance on that practice. When I was in the state assembly, I supported legislation uh, that cracked down on that practice, but we need to be more vigilant, especially in the housing crisis. But you know, it's private landlords and it's also NYCHA because they've been warehousing thousands of apartments for years. And I've exposed it year after year, going back to when I was Manhattan Borough President. And we have to make every unit available in the time of the pandemic, in the time when we have record homelessness. I also wanna say that Part of what a mayor has to do is reset the relationship with Albany. You know, Bill de Blasio has played checkers to Andrew Cuomo's chess and New York City has not had full on representation, making sure that we have the laws and protections we need. I was very proud as an elected official to stand with the anti IDCers, uh, young people who ran against the entrenched democratic machine, ran against uh, senators who actually caucus with Republicans. I supported them, work with them. They're supporting me. I'm going to work as mayor with them to 
make sure we continue to have the strongest tenant protections, anti-warehousing legislation, so that people can just feel that they can make it in this town. People sometimes don't realize that a piece of legislation go a long way in keeping the predators at bay. And I will do that as mayor working in tandem with our Albany uh, coalition. Thank you. Apologies, I muted myself for a second there. Sean Donovan, the question for you is um, what your administration would do to help communities stop predatory landlords from warehousing apartments. Go ahead. I'm glad you're back, Ben. Thank you. Uh, so look, first you have to ask yourself, how do these apartments become vacant? They often become vacant because you have landlords that are harassing tenants and forcing them out of units. So we need to do a much better job of preventing those vacancies in the first place through the right to shelter, through much more proactive code enforcement that I talked about earlier, and a series of other steps uh, that would make sure that we keep those units occupied to begin with. Second, we need to make sure that the, that the incentives for vacating those units uh, are not what they are today. And that means working with Albany on our rent laws and a series of other steps uh, to make sure that folks can stay in those units and uh, they, they remain housed. But we should also need to think more broadly about how housing is owned in this city. You know, after I worked with the National Coalition for the Homeless, I came to the Bronx to work with a nonprofit and I helped build thousands of units of Nehemiah housing for public housing residents buying their first home and building wealth. We need to think about other forms of community ownership like co-ops, land trusts, and other new forms that Thank allow you. nonprofits and others to make sure that we create truly affordable, permanently affordable housing. Thank you. Carlos Menchaca, over to you. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so big, bold ideas. That's what we need right now. We need to remove this warehousing and bring them back into the hands of New Yorkers. We need a vacancy tax. Uh, we need to be strong about that. Part of the excitement that I have right now is that we have a super majority in Albany right now with the state Senate. We've got to work with them and all the progressives up there to make some changes. But the term that I want to bring out right now is municipalizing these empty apartments. That's going to look like a lot of different things. So if people are excited about that, send me a message on carlos2021.com, sign up, and there's a little box, say that you want to help me figure that out. Uh, right now, we're going to need to really build out uh, ideas and how to bring those apartments in. And I think the other piece to this is the universal basic income is going to help people get to those, those apartments. Uh, but part of this is making sure that they're affordable. And this is why the rezonings have to stop. Uh, and that's how I'm going to think about this. Thank you. Thank you. Diane Morales, uh, how do you prevent, uh, as our questioner puts it, predatory landlords from warehousing vacant apartments for profit? Thanks. Um, so I think a couple of different things. I, th this is a, this requires a multi-pronged strategy. Um, I think while we are living at a time with unprecedented challenges, we have a window coming up in 2021 that will provide unprecedented opportunity for us to fundamentally transform the way housing operates in New York City. I'm going to keep hammering at that because I think that's what's most important here. Um, between the supermajority that Carlos just referenced that we have at the state level and the unprecedented number of vacancies that we have at the city council level, we, not, we need to form a coalition of folks who are absolutely committed to the idea of changing the housing model in New York City. And that means moving away from this private developer model to increasing tenant ownership increasing cooperative housing models and increasing the community land trust model that I've been talking about. Um, the, this is an unprecedented, uh, unprecedented opportunity for us and I think we need to seize it. Thank we'll you. never get this opportunity again in our lifetime. Thank you. Eric Adams, how do you uh, prevent this type of, of warehousing that our questioner referred to? Oh, unmute yourself quick. Surprised I was mute, it's hard to mute me, you know? <laughs> First, we need to really focus on uh, how do we stop incentivizing, allowing landlords to warehouse apartments. Uh, but again, I shared uh, uh, Diane's uh, vision uh, that it's home ownership. I remember purchasing my first small co-op and it allowed me to really start the 
possibility of moving to buy homes one day. We have, we have to reinvest in the Mission Lama program. Uh, we need a new version of that. But there's something that no one seems to talk about, ERSTAT law. Why are people outside our city controlling our housing stock? Let's repeal the ERSTAT law. Let's bring it back to the city. We should control and vote on those lawmakers uh, that should have an impact on, on our housing. And we should also, as it was mentioned earlier, legal assistance. I think nothing is more important than giving those who have to go to uh, the various housing courts the, the legal assistance that they deserve. It's intimidating to go into a courtroom and find yourself losing your home based on a decision that you don't quite understand. And I think that that Thank is you. so important. Thank you. Uh, Joycelyn Taylor, over to you. How do you prevent the warehousing of vacant apartments? Well, one of the, on the proactive side, I think that the city has to take the lead in building more affordable housing and less luxury housing because then it will these uh, landlords won't be have the incentive to want to have these apartments vacant so that they can charge more than new tenants. So if the city is the lead in providing affordable housing, then they'll be setting the example for the landlords, and landlords will. Uh, start utilizing this behavior. But the other thing I want to talk about is the ownership opportunities as well. Listen, I wouldn't own a home today if it were not for HPD's home ownership um, program. So we have to start being more proactive about creating opportunities and ownership for people because that's how people build stability, wealth, and legacy. And I think on the reactive side, one of the things that we should look at is creating a vacancy tax so that people don't hold on to apartments waiting to, for the opportunity to charge more. It shouldn't be, everything doesn't have to be about profit. We should to be have some level of decency and want to make sure that people have housing that they need. That's a basic right. Thank you. Catherine Garcia, over to you. That one of the challenges in the housing market is economics 101. We don't build enough housing across the board in any, perhaps except for the most luxury sector, do we ever have enough? We cannot tolerate warehousing vacant apartments when we know that we have a homeless crisis and we have a housing affordability crisis. That's an enforcement issue that we can work with and with Albany to make sure we have the strongest tools to disincentivize anyone from doing that. But it is true, as others have mentioned, they become vacant because someone is evicted. And those folks need to be protected from evictions. But I really wanna see a New York City, that was the New York City of my youth where my parents were able to buy and raise five of us uh, in the city of New York, not always easily, but, uh, but they were able to do it. New Yorkers don't necessarily want easy, but they don't want it to be impossible. And being able to give them rents that they can afford and home ownership opportunities has to be our goal. Thank you. And Maya Wiley. Sorry, well, I just wanna thank everyone for this forum and, and, and to all the candidates. It was such a pleasure to be with all of you today as well as the audience. And Ben, you did a good job. Um, let me just say that I have been so fortunate that both as a baby living on the Lower East Side and as a Columbia Law student, it was Mitchell Lama Apartments that both enabled my parents to be activists uh, in the civil rights movement and allowed me to put myself through law school. And so the way I approach this is a point of dignity is we need a comprehensive housing approach. And that must then include, yes, a vacancy tax. I agree. <laughs> uh, because if you want to keep it off the market, you'll have to pay to do it. And that creates the incentive not to. And it's not enough because of everything that everyone's already said. We need land banks. We need first purchase opportunities. And we need the ability to have community purchase options so that not-for-profit housing developers, the developers who are the ones who create permanently affordable housing and work very hard against eviction, uh, uh, are able to actually participate in solving our housing problems. So there's no one size fits all here. There's no one single solution. And the way we must work is together on solving these problems. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say, you know, I'm looking down here uh, at, at six, seven, eight other uh, topics that, uh, you know, I was trying to sneak things in on at different points, but we obviously want to make sure to let the conference continue. 
as it going and continue uh, all of you with your days. And, you know, we have a lot of time coming up where I know my colleagues and I uh, in the media will be asking you lots more of these questions. And also, um, obviously, the groups actually doing the work will be asking you questions as well. But thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much to the uh, West Side Tenants Conference, especially the Housing Conservation Coordinators and the West Side Neighborhood Alliance for putting this together and inviting me. And thank you, candidates, uh, all for participating. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good seeing everyone.